Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless we are covering a global market sell-off this morning this is underway right now the dow jones industrial is now down 1250 points that is a loss of more than three percent and the stock market is opening in the red this morning after a rough finish last week on a weaker than expected jobs report the dow is down more than a thousand points as that global sell-off intensifies we woke up this morning to news about volatile markets overseas, including a giant drop in Japan, and it got us kind of worried. A black day for the Nikkei. Japan's benchmark stock index fell by a record 4,451 points to mark a more than 12% loss on Monday. History in the making. Of what some would call history in the making. Scary, been, don't say that. We have never <laughs> been down 1,000 points ever, not even intraday on the Nasdaq. Is that true? That is true. Okay. I'm down 6% right from the get-go. This is heavy, heavy set, big tech. Here we go. Look at them go down. Microsoft is down 20 bucks. That's 5%. Alphabet, 5%. Meta, 6%. Amazon, 6%. Apple, 9% down. Germany taking the worst hit down almost 3.5%. Asia, we had right across the board. And remember what we saw in Japan. Japan's now in a bear market. Japan lost 12%, over 12% actually, at the close. It's getting ugly real fast out there. So, I mean, look, right now, the volatility index or the fear gauge, which is a measure of how afraid investors are right now, it's at a 65. And just to put that in perspective, if we go back to March, March of 2020, when the pandemic was full swing and people were locked up in their houses, it was 53. It's 65 right now. You go back to March of 2009 when we had the banking crisis, it was 44. We're at a 65 right now. Investors are incredibly scared. And I have to tell you, this cannot just be due to Friday's payroll report. Because on Friday, the market was down about 2%. So there's more going on than just that. I think the other two issues are number one, Warren Buffett. Buffett unloaded half of his Apple position. That's a guy who's buy and hold forever. All of a sudden, he's, you know, maybe not, maybe he doesn't have a high conviction on Apple going forward. And then, obviously, the increasing probability of a full-scale war in the Middle East. You put those three things together, and it's an ugly situation in the markets today. Sometimes you have to panic. Sometimes the theater is on fire. I mean, I mean, this whole notion in life, you don't panic. Sometimes in life, you do have to panic. Even people who do not believe in Jesus Christ and the end times know something is very wrong with our world. As of late, I have been hearing from so many people that 2024 will be the year when America goes over the edge. We are on the verge of World War III. Our financial system is teetering on the brink of disaster. Homelessness is rising at the fastest pace ever recorded. Drug and alcohol abuse are off the charts. Lawlessness runs unchecked. Food banks are facing unprecedented demand for their services. And it's not just happening in the United States. It's happening all over the world. I believe that 2024 will be the most chaotic election year in the entire history of our nation, with many saying the U.S. is heading for civil war. All of this is happening in the global framework of wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, famine, and natural disasters, all of which are happening more frequently and more intensely. A perfect storm is raging all around us. Billions of people have become deeply concerned about what the immediate future will look like. The global agenda for a one world government, a one world financial system, and a one world religion are already set in place. All the world needs now is for the Antichrist to make his appearance onto the world stage. All of this can only point to one fact. The rapture, the seven year tribulation, and the Antichrist are just a heartbeat away from becoming reality. The Bible warns of the times we are living in, and God through his grace and mercy has showed us the end from the beginning. And now his watchmen 
are blowing the trumpet. Jesus is coming for the believer. No more pain or sorrow, but for the unbeliever, there will be misery and grief. Buckle up and hold on tight. By looking at world events, it seems probable 2024 will be the year when everything converges and with it the rapture, the seven year tribulation, and the revealing of the Antichrist. Luke 21:36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Are you ready for what comes next? If you think this world is going to get better, or if you think there's going to be world peace, if you are waiting for utopia, then you will be disappointed big time. As we are hurling toward Armageddon, the Bible says that there will appear a character on the world stage, an individual known as the man of lawlessness. He will make false promises of world peace, harmony, and hope. He will lull the world into believing in him, even worshiping him as their Messiah. But he will end up abusing humanity like they have never been tormented before. Christians know him as the Antichrist. After a brief temporary success, he will be defeated and destroyed by our coming King Jesus Christ, our true Savior. Just as he promised, Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead and take his true followers to heaven. He is coming for us and it won't be long. He could come in the next minute or the next week or the next year. He is coming soon. Are you ready? When the rapture occurs, the world will capture the moment. Cell phones, security cameras, law enforcement body cams, doorbell cams, and more will all bear video record of the great disappearance. The world will reel with concern from watching the strange, mind-boggling and unbelievable video footage that goes viral across the globe. People vanish before their eyes and all caught on camera. This event won't be science fiction, conspiracy theory, or mindless speculation. When Christ comes for his people, it will be in the twinkling of an eye. Between the resurrected dead and the raptured, billions of people will exit this planet in an instant, but billions will be left behind. It will be chaos on our globe but incredible, glorious joy in the skies. This is the rapture, the great disappearance. It is vital to know what the Bible says about this coming day, the next event on God's prophetic agenda for the earth. Are you ready? Don't get left behind. Call upon the name of Jesus today. The Biden administration believes Iran could launch a major attack against Israel as soon as today. The head of U.S. Central Command is in the region to build a coalition to help defend the Jewish state. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel stands ready to defend itself against any enemy attack. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. Netanyahu sees the situation as a seven front war where Iran and its proxies are trying to strangle the Jewish state. Their visible aggression is insatiable, but Israel is not helpless. We're determined to stand against them on every front, in every arena, far and near. Anyone who murders our citizens, anyone who harms our country will be held accountable. He will pay a very heavy price. Some anticipate Iran launching a bigger attack than April 13th, when some 350 projectiles rained down across Israel, resulting in only minor damage. The Alma Research Center here 
estimates a combination of ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and UAVs from many sites in western Iran. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has dispatched a fighter squadron to the region, and the head of Central Command, General Michael Carrilla, is already here in the region. Retired IDF General Amir Avivi tells CBN News, Kurilla is expected to play a valuable role in helping coordinate a similar coalition effort that protected Israel in April. It enables to really assist Israel to deal with all the different threats, whether it's ballistic missiles, UAVs, or any other capability Iran might shoot at Israel or Hezbollah. And it increases dramatically the chances of really being able to secure Israel the best way possible. Hezbollah leader uh, Hassan Israel threatening maybe that he will hit Tel Aviv or other civilian centers. Do you think that threat is real? And if so, how do you think Israel would respond? If Hezbollah will shoot Israeli centers, this is a full-scale war. We'll have no other choice but to attack with all our capabilities. And I can tell you that uh, Israel can inflict huge, huge damage on Hezbollah and also on Lebanon overall. On Sunday, Israel's Home Front Command announced a new early warning system called Personal Message. It's a world-class system that sends defensive messages against large-scale emergencies that erupt. The alert is sent to mobile phones that are under threat, without the need for an application, and without the need to perform any action on the part of the citizen. A BBC's Israel's war taking on great significance, and far from being a local or even regional conflict. We have a Chinese-Russian-Iranian front that has emerged in the Middle East. It's challenging the U.S., it's challenging the whole Middle East. Israel is at the front of this Eastern coalition that has emerged, but it's a challenge for the whole Western society. Some reports indicate Iran may wait until August 12th and 13th, when Jews mark a day called Tisha B'Av, or the 9th of Av. It's a day when Jews lament the destruction of the first and second Jewish temples and other calamities in Jewish history. The day ends a three-week period of mourning known as the Dire Straits. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict, and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples, all who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Overseas now to the Middle East on high alert as Iran vows revenge for the assassination of a top Hamas leader in Tehran. The Biden administration promising additional military assets to help defend Israel, while the president is also trying to de-escalate tensions in the region. Tonight, the Biden administration bracing for a potential escalation in the Middle East. The Pentagon announcing it will deploy additional U.S. cruisers, destroyers, and fighter jets to protect Israel. The secretary will be directing multiple forthcoming fo force posture moves to bolster force protection. It comes as Iran and its allies promise to retaliate following the assassination of top Hamas political official Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran. In April, Iran coordinated an unprecedented direct attack against Israel in response to a deadly strike on the Iranian consulate in Syria. The U.S. and its allies helping intercept nearly all of the more than 300 missiles and drones targeting Israel. Amid concerns of another Iranian retaliation, today Haniya's funeral prayers taking place in Doha. Sources say Hania was killed by an explosive smuggled into his room at an Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps guest house. The device stashed inside roughly two months ago as part of an Israeli plot, as first reported by the New York Times. The assassination threatening to upend ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. 
Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Fuad Shukr was Hezbollah's most senior military official. Israel killed him in a rare strike in Beirut's southern suburbs in what was seen as a serious security breach. Hezbollah called Tuesday night's assassination an aggression. That's part of the sacrifices the group has been paying for its support of Gaza. But leader Hassan Nasrallah said the conflict has moved beyond that. You don't know what red lines you have crossed. You don't know what kind of an aggression you carried out and where you took this conflict. That is why you should know all the fronts have entered a new phase different from the past. Hezbollah says the assassination of Shukr violated the unwritten rules of engagement between the group and the Israeli army because it was an attack in Beirut on a residential building and it killed civilians. Nasrallah is promising what he's calling a real, not a symbolic response. When Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah talks about a real response, what this means is that Hezbollah could target military or political personalities, for example, or a group of soldiers or commanders or strategic facilities. Israel claimed responsibility for Shukr's killing, but has remained silent on the assassination a day later in Iran of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniyeh. Almost 10 months since Israel began its war on Gaza, Iran and its regional allies have been trying to strike a balance between putting military pressure on Israel and avoiding an all-out regional war. The two assassinations in Beirut and Tehran in just a matter of hours have again brought the region to the brink. Israel says it doesn't want a full-on war but that it's ready for any scenario. Israeli media are reporting Israeli and American officials have been in discussions to prepare for a potential retaliation from Iran and its allies. Israel has expanded the parameters of the conflict. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he will not submit to calls for an end to the war on Gaza. But Hezbollah, which is part of the Iranian-led regional network, says Hamas will not surrender in Gaza, nor will the other support fronts. The trend appears to be towards escalation. To another Fox News alert, Israeli officials are bracing for a potential attack from Iran in retaliation for recent assassinations of the top Hezbollah and Hamas leaders. The attack could reportedly come as early as today. Israel is bracing as the country worries that an attack from Iran and its proxies could be just around the corner. The Wall Street Journal does report that Iran told U.S. and Arab diplomats that it didn't care if its counterstrike started a war. Jordan's foreign minister was in Iran yesterday for a meeting, and President Biden is scheduled to speak with Jordanian King Abdullah II. But there has been very little public Iranian interaction with those trying to avert a crisis. With this in mind, Israel is taking steps to prepare for prolonged conflict. As reports indicate, the initial Iranian response could come in waves and include extensive missile and drone attacks. A document sent to mayors of northern cities told officials to prepare for water outages, power cuts, and evacuations. And in Jerusalem, an underground command bunker for government officials was opened by the Shin Bet security agency. Preparations for war in the north and with Iran coming with fighting inside the Gaza Strip, you have Israeli negotiators in the region traveling to Cairo, Egypt this weekend for talks about a possible ceasefire. They reportedly made no progress. Israel has ramped up strikes against Gaza in recent days, going after Hamas, but killing dozens of civilians in the process. The real question now is what comes next for the region. There are ongoing negotiations behind the scenes and conversations taking place, but the current stance of Israeli officials is the question of an Iranian attack is not if, but rather when. What is this potential attack expected to look like? As you say, it could come in waves. So I've been speaking with Israeli defense officials, and they say they are worried this time around because they think they'll get less warning time before the attack is actually launched. Remember, in April, there were drones 
launched ahead of time, and this gave the Israelis an indication that the attack was underway. The Iranians followed up with crews and ballistic missiles. This time, if they lead with ballistic missiles or with an attack and barrage from Hezbollah along the border in northern Israel, it could catch the Israelis off guard and overwhelm their air defense systems. So initial reports do indicate that strategic military targets, like the port behind me in Haifa, could be on the target list for the Iranians. And the real concern here is that this counterattack by Iran could unravel and lead the region into a much broader war. As time goes on, anticipation is growing, and Israelis are becoming more and more concerned as to what kind of retaliation we should expect and when exactly that will come. So I'm here out now in Tel Aviv to speak to a few people, to hear how they're feeling, and to see if they are preparing for an attack. i um, just got to stay safe, follow the home front command guidelines, and yeah, just got our bomb shelter, go with some water, with some snacks, and I mean, it's a beautiful day out, just got to take each day as it comes. Yeah, definitely feeling a little bit anxious, a little bit scared, but uh, it's just the reality we live in in Israel, and the people are amazing. Um, spirits are high, so just got to hope for the best. It's not that I don't think there will be damage and serious damage to Israel, but if this is the price that we have to pay, then that's it. Uh, you don't see, in general, generally, uh, uh, running away of Israelis from the country. You see them standing it's quite strong. It's quite impressive, I think. Uh, because this, there's no way to, to run away, that's it. I think this, you know, the support last time in the Iranian attack um, really showed the strength we built in our allies. So I really hope it's a good versus evil thing again and the world can come together to really fight and uh, battle evil. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Protesters stormed the residence of Bangladesh's Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina. Weeks of violent demonstrations across the South Asian country have killed at least 300 people. In an address to the nation, the army chief confirmed Hasina had resigned and fled the country. He urged people to trust in the military to restore calm and ensure those responsible for the killings are punished. The country is witnessing a period of revolution right now. The protest started last month with a demand to end quotas in government jobs reserved for relatives of people who fought in the War of Independence more than 50 years ago. There was a pause in the demonstrations after the Supreme Court scrapped most quotas, but students came back to the streets demanding justice for the families of those killed and the resignation of the Prime Minister. More than 90 people were killed on Sunday alone, including 13 police officers, when demonstrators attacked a police station. The army has promised to form an interim government but there are concerns about lack of trust in the military among the protesters. 76-year-old Hasina won a fourth straight term in January this year. The election was boycotted by the main opposition party. Her party, the Awami League, has been accused of rights abuses and corruption for years. Hasina's resignation and fleeing the country is being widely celebrated across Bangladesh. 
but restoring calm, assuring accountability and trust in a military that is itself accused of widespread abuse poses a huge challenge in the days and weeks ahead. Another day, another battle between rioters and the police. The front line this time, a hotel housing migrants in Rotherham in the north of England. The far-right protest, advertised as peaceful, quickly descending into violence. Police taking the brunt of it, trying to protect those trapped inside. But there's no sign of letting up here or in other parts of England. In Middlesbrough, in the northeast, police struggling to hold back more rioters. As disorder spreads, sparked by false rumours online that a suspect in the murder of three young girls in Southport a week ago was a Muslim immigrant. The British Prime Minister warning instigators they will be punished. Overnight, the city of Liverpool saw some of the worst violence, youths torching their own neighbourhood. The damage clear in the light of day. This Romanian shop was a target of looting. Workers left to pick up the pieces. After days of violence, communities can only hope it all ends soon. Susan Wangari's been searching for her son, Emmanuel, for more than a month. She says he went to work in central Nairobi on the 25th of June. The day tens of thousands of mostly young people protested in about 50 towns and cities. Emmanuel's sister told us he joined, and this is him. They haven't seen him since. Demonstrations started against a finance bill that would have raised taxes. They spread across the country amid growing calls to end corruption and for President William Ruto to resign. The day that Emmanuel disappeared, protesters entered Parliament. Police killed dozens of them. Since then, hundreds of people have been arrested and dozens of others have disappeared or been abducted by men in plain clothes. Many of them say they were beaten, interrogated and then released. But several people are still missing and others, like Franklin Ondwari, have been found dead. His body was found in a public toilet. An autopsy revealed he was strangled. President Ruto's promised government reforms and justice for those killed. If there is any Kenyan who has disappeared, I want people to step forward and say, Kenyan so-and-so has disappeared. I would be very happy to deal with it. Campaigners say his actions don't match his words. Almost every day, families come here to the city mortuary to look for loved ones. Rights groups say police bring bodies and submit reports that don't add up. Please don't comment on the abductions. They deny extrajudicial killings. What the police are doing through the orders of the executive is violating those constitutional rights. And we cannot accept to live in this kinds of environment where merely exercising a right leads to someone being killed. Any justice will be too late for university student Denzel Amondi. His body was found floating in a disused quarry days after he attended a protest. Asking where that my son is. Others, like Susan, just want answers. Chaos on the outskirts of Nigeria's capital. Police fire tear gas at protesters after they lit bonfires and torched a police station. Activists have declared 10 days of nationwide demonstrations to rally against rising cost of living. Many are angered by President Bola Tinubu's removal of a fuel subsidy, which he announced during his inauguration in May last year. In the northern city of Kano, a curfew was imposed after shops and government buildings were looted and vandalized. There were similar scenes in the northeast state of Yorbe and in Maiduguri in Borno state, where police fired tear gas to disperse crowds. A curfew is now in place. Another tense day in Nigeria as demonstrators return to the streets. Police in Abuja loved tear gas at protesters, demanding government action to reduce a high cost of living. They are also demanding broad economic, political and social reforms. The violence and destruction from two days of protests has heightened fears across the country. 
want to warn those that are recalcitrant, those that don't want to listen, that will not fold our hands and see our country to be destroyed. In the northern state of Yobe, despite a curfew, hoodlums attacked Red Cross offices and vandalized its vehicles. And in Lagos, a standoff between protesters and the police continues with businesses worried about possible attacks on their investments. They have been on here. We have, uh, we have put a strategy in place. We are interfacing with the protesters, we are engaging them. Despite assurances from the police, many businesses remain closed for a second day. Analysts warn that the economy, which is already fragile, could suffer long-term damage if the protests continue. The demonstrators insist they will remain on the streets until the government hears them. I will not expect any government that calls itself democratic to then remain adamant, despite that people have spoken and have, they have spoken clearly. With seven days of protests left, there are fears of further confrontations between demonstrators and security forces, especially in areas that have seen violence and destruction. Venezuela is bracing for more protests today after Sunday's presidential elections. President Nicolas Maduro now accusing the U.S. of what he calls a coup attempt following the country's contested election. The U.S. rejects the claim, but officials say it is clear that Maduro lost. Long lines of people waiting for news of their loved ones who have been detained for protesting against Venezuela's election. Cecilia Paez's grandson is one of them. Mr. President, it's not my fault to be here waiting for my grandson. I did not send him to do anything wrong. You can burn me alive if you want, but release my grandson well and alive because he's the only one I have. At least 1,200 people have been detained. The opposition insists the government of Nicolás Maduro committed fraud last Sunday. It says it has the original tally sheets that prove that Mundo González is the true winner and are calling on people to take to the streets on Saturday. We are going to make the truth come through. The world will see the strength and determination of a society decided to live in freedom. The Electoral Council says Maduro won with 51 percent of the vote, but so far has failed to show the tally sheets that prove his victory. The government says the system was hacked and demanded a formal investigation by the Supreme Court. On Friday, 10 presidential candidates showed up, including Maduro. But the main opposition candidate, Edmundo González, was not there. Once again, the fascist candidate, González, is not showing his face. What is he planning? More violence? They have some criminals in hiding that we have not yet detained for setting buses on fire, police stations, cars. Why are you not showing your face, Mr. González? González has been publicly threatened with prison by the Attorney General and other members of Maduro's government. Meanwhile, the United States and other countries in the region have declared that González won the elections. Leftist presidents from Colombia, Brazil and Mexico are asking Maduro to show the results. As the opposition continues to call for protests against the government, the country is getting ready to see more chaos and pain. Tens of thousands of people several kilometers long. These are people who are heading to the venue at Sawabi, a major power show by the Pakistan Tariq and South one year after Imran Khan was arrested by the government. Several of their leaders are in jail. But that, of course, has not diminished the enthusiasm of these supporters who've been pouring from across the country, from the southern province of Sindh, from the Punjab, as well as Baluchistan province. But the largest show of force is going to be held here in Sawabi. A clear message to the government that their days are numbered according to these people. I stand with Imran Khan as he is our only truthful leader in this country who has been put in jail for one year by the corrupt government. Our struggle will continue until he is released. And of course they're encouraged by the events in Bangladesh where Hasina Wajid has already fled. The only purpose of our gathering here in Swabi is to protest for the release of our leader, Imran Khan. Look at what happened to Hasina Wajid in Bangladesh. She too suppressed people's voices, and it's the same in Pakistan. I think that Shabazz Sharif will run like her. The message people here say is loud and clear that once the people decide, their will will prevail.
Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.